Thanks for watching NTD Business. Coming up. World leaders and members of the British royal family pay their last respects to Queen Elizabeth II as 10 days of mourning come to an end. Winter is coming and the electricity costs are soaring. What can be done to tame the rising prices? Denver aims to tackle homelessness by giving out thousands of dollars in cash and free cell phones. With that and much more coming up on NTD Business. Great to have you with us. Paul Graney here. In a final farewell to Queen Elizabeth II, King Charles and other senior British royals joined world leaders today in paying their last respects. Matt Lateranda has more. Queen Elizabeth's coffin was carried into Westminster Abbey on Monday as 10 days of mourning for Britain's beloved monarch entered their final hours. King Charles and the royal family, including her great-grandchildren Prince George and Princess Charlotte, joined an unprecedented gathering of some 500 leaders and dignitaries from every corner of the globe. The last post and a two-minute silence brought the service to an end. Earlier, tens of thousands of people had lined the streets as the Queen's casket made the short journey from Westminster Hall, where she had been lying in state. It was pulled along on a gun carriage by 142 Royal Navy sailors with their arms linked. And they were preceded by a procession of hundreds of military personnel in full ceremonial dress. In London's Hyde Park and in homes and locations worldwide, Many more thousands of mourners fell silent as the Queen's coffin appeared on their screens. After the service, a second royal procession through London marked the start of the casket's journey west to Windsor Castle, the final resting place of Queen Elizabeth II, who died aged 96 on September 8th at Balmoral in Scotland after 70 years on the throne. Back in the States, President Biden says U.S. forces would defend Taiwan if China attempts to invade the island. He made the statement on Sunday in an interview with 60 Minutes on CBS. Here's the clip. Taiwan makes their own judgments about their independence. We are not moving. We're not encouraging their being independent. We're not let that's their decision. But would U.S. forces defend the island? Yes, if in fact there was an unprecedented attack. So unlike Ukraine, to be clear, sir, U.S. forces, U.S. men and women, would defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese invasion. Yes. However, the White House said after the interview that U.S. policy hasn't changed. That policy says Washington wants to see Taiwan's status resolved peacefully, but doesn't say whether the U.S. forces might be sent in response to a Chinese attack. Taiwan's foreign ministry expressed, quote, sincere gratitude to Biden today. That was for, in their words, affirming the U.S. government's rock-solid promise of security to Taiwan. In the same interview, the president said the COVID-19 pandemic has ended. That sparked some backlash, though. He was at the Detroit Auto Show when CBS asked him if the pandemic was indeed over. Here's what he said. The pandemic is over. We still have a problem with COVID. We're still doing a lot of work on it. Uh, it's, but the pandemic is over. If you notice, no one's wearing masks. Everybody seems to be in pretty good shape. And so I think it's changing, and I think this is a perfect example of it. But despite Biden's comments, his administration still seems to treat the pandemic as an emergency. It's also fighting legal battles over mask mandates and vaccine mandates arguing that they're still needed to protect public health. Technically, the UN's World Health Organization declares pandemics and the WHO hasn't said the pandemic is over just yet. COVID-19 metrics have plunged since peaking late last year and early this year. Newer variants have proven less deadly, although vaccines and prior infection don't protect as well against them. And electricity bills are soaring all across the United States, and they're likely to rise even more this winter. 
Average cost of electricity last year was about $56 per megawatt hour. This year, it's $85 so far. FYI, one megawatt hour is a little over a month's worth of electricity for the average American home. The hardest hit area may be New England in the U.S. Northeast. There's significant opposition to fossil fuels there, which has led to limited pipeline capacity and very high electricity prices. They depend on liquefied natural gas, but a lot of that is now being shipped abroad. Europe is buying up much of it after reducing the amount of gas coming through Russian pipelines. And while New England has invested heavily in renewable energy, there isn't enough to power them through the winter. It's not just New England feeling the pain. The federal government estimates that one of every six Americans are behind on their utility bills. He's going to Ben Colo of Mr. Electric. He's an electricity supplier in Iowa. We've seen a noticeable jump in the, in the cost of electricity uh, across the board, especially um, places that uh, utilize natural gas uh, and some of those kind of things. We're primarily coal-fired here in the Midwest. Uh, but we have uh, seen about a 15 or 20 percent increase in the kilowatt hour uh, rate. Cola says his clients are looking for ways to save money, especially renters. Homeowners tell him they see increased costs in just about everything here's telling you. But natural gas is a main reason for the higher prices. It generates the largest proportion of America's electricity, 38 percent last year. And that means everything from manufacturing to fertilizer production is more expensive now. In fact, a worldwide gas shortage has caused prices to double. Vladimir Putin's gas game with Europe is a major factor. But Europe was already concerned about a cold winter before the invasion. Now, they're in an even more desperate situation. But at least one group isn't complaining. American producers. They're happily shipping Europe liquefied natural gas. Last year, the U.S. shipped more natural gas than ever, and this year, producers have put the pedal to the metal. Asia used to be America's largest export destination. Now it's Europe. In the first four months of 2022, we shipped almost three quarters of U.S. natural gas to Europe. But the more we ship to Europe, the less there is at home. This leads to higher prices for Americans. So, do producers make more money by shipping it abroad? We asked Tom McNulty of energy consultancy T.J. McNulty and Company. We're at maximum capacity, though. You can't simply just send it. You have to have the terminals. These are huge, complicated projects to build LNG facilities that can then load up. And the the ships are complicated, expensive ships that take the LNG across the Atlantic. So there's no question if you can sell your gas at the higher price. I don't have a problem with that because we want, you know, a free market. McNulty says there are other problems, including supply chain constraints, a desire to return capital to investors instead of drilling more wells, got to look after the shareholders, right? and a hostile attitude toward fossil fuels from Washington and other governments, Europe included. We asked him what the answer to the problem is. Independent producers who are less beholden, perhaps, to Washington and New York can produce more. And I think we'll see them beginning to produce more. There is a lot of free cash flow and there is enough free cash flow to do the dividends and return of capital and make more wells. McNulty says there are around 9,000 independent oil and natural gas producers in the United States, and they develop the vast majority of America's natural gas, 90% from independent producers. They employ an average of just 12 people. McNulty says the ones that are well-run may have enough capital to pay their shareholders and drill more wells. Woohoo for everyone. And hopefully they'll drill down some of your electricity bills. Natural gas futures rose about 1.5% today. Down on Wall Street, the main indexes closed higher too, though, recovering some losses from last week. The Dow gained 197 points, 6 tenths of a percent. S&P 500 rose 27 points, 7 tenths of a percent. And the Nasdaq added 87 points, 8 tenths of a percent. But yields of a 10-year U.S. Treasury bill jumped to their highest level in over a decade today. 
The 10-year note is the most widely tracked government debt instrument. Its yield is often used as a benchmark for other interest rates. Think your mortgage rate or credit card debt rate. Investors are gearing up for the Fed to raise interest rates even higher and possibly for a longer time. Freddie Joyner has more. 10-year U.S. Treasury yields jumped to their highest level since 2011 on Monday. As investors adjusted for the likelihood that the Federal Reserve will hike interest rates higher and for longer than previously expected. Data last week showed higher than expected consumer prices in August, dashing hopes that the worst of rising price pressures may be in the past. It also made it more likely that Fed Chairman Jerome Powell and the rest of the Fed policymakers will hike rates by another 75 basis points when it concludes its two-day meeting on Wednesday. Investors are grappling to determine how long the Fed will aggressively raise rates as monetary tightening raises concerns about economic growth. It is not just in the United States that rate rises are expected. Most of the central banks meeting this week, from Switzerland to South Africa, are expected to hike. Monday, the U.S. benchmark 10-year yields briefly crossed 3.5 percent, the highest since April 2011 before falling back. Two-year yields reached 3.9 percent, the highest since November 2007. And for those paying attention, you might notice that the two-year yield is now higher than the 10-year. This is known as an inverted yield curve. It's viewed by some economists as an indicator that a recession will follow in one to two years. I'll keep you updated. And while the markets rose today, cryptocurrencies, not so much luck. They fell to fresh lows today. They went back up a little bit later, though. The largest token, Bitcoin, fell over 5% at one point to a three-month low of just under $18,400. Ether dropped over 3% to at one point to two-month low. Ether's drop-off comes just days after its Bitcoin, its blockchain, had a major upgrade. It cut energy use and changed the way transactions are processed. But investors have turned shy on Ether after a U.S. regulator implied the upgrade could lead to extra regulation. Cryptos have fallen from previous highs in recent months, investors turning away from riskier assets due to interest rates rising around the world. Looking for safe havens, you see. Now we turn to Denver, Colorado. Take a close look at a new city program that aims to tackle homelessness. Big problem. This experiment asks, will the problem get better if we provide the homeless with monetary assistance? According to his news release, the city's basic income program, sort of like UBI, right, will give hundreds of homeless people up to $1,000 of cash every month for one year. Also get a free cell phone with service for a year as well, with no strings attached. The program will mainly target women, transgender, and gender non-conforming persons and families. According to the release, no men listed. The goal here is to reduce homelessness, increase employment among recipients, and reduce their spending on alcohol, drugs, and cigarettes. The money will come from the American Rescue Plan Act, which was signed into law by President Biden. But the results of the project won't be available until 2024. And the program will be evaluated by University of Denver's Center for Housing and Homeless Research, In fact, it's not just Denver trying this. Other cities include Los Angeles, New York. They're doing similar projects. But numerous studies have been conducted on whether welfare has the effect of actually lifting people out of poverty. In 2009, a study called an empirical analysis of the dynamics of the welfare state, catchy, right, found that welfare disincentivizes people from working in the long run. The study found that increasing spending on welfare actually increased unemployment over a 10-year period. And the conclusions from this study are applied to the Denver Homelessness Project. It suggests that the monetary assistance in the long run will not motivate the individuals to pull themselves out of homelessness. In fact, the monetary assistance may actually motivate them to stay homeless. Just as stimulus checks motivated to be unemployed, according to a Harvard Business Review in 2021, As stimulus checks were sent out, a record number of workers quit their jobs, creating the so-called Great Resignation. According to American economist William Niskassen, the welfare system has spawned a culture of poverty, which in turn discourages personal responsibility, 
feeds a vicious cycle of unemployment and dependence on the government. In a study, he found that welfare benefits for the poor actually increase the poverty rate, at the same time increasing unemployment and creating a population that depends on welfare. So what is the solution? His study shows that reducing poverty has a lot to do with education. A higher percentage of the population with high school or higher education reduces dependency on government welfare and reduces poverty and unemployment. Still to come this evening. Stay with us. Anthony Shaw Marshall takes us to a festival in New York City dedicated to Japanese food and culture. And a rare space diamond could help manufacturing. Scientists can figure out how to recreate the diamond here on Earth. We have that and much more coming up on NTD Business. Welcome back. Bed, bath, and beyond is trying to stay afloat. It means layoffs and shutdowns. The retailer plans to close 150 of its stores. It just announced 50 closures today. Spread out across the country from Arizona to Washington State, the company is trying to rescue itself and keep from having to file bankruptcy, helping cutting jobs and closing stores along with more than $500 million in financing will do the trick. But one analyst said the efforts were, quote, prototypical rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. It's because the business model itself is struggling against other big box stores and Amazon's low, low prices. I'm going to talk a little bit about showbiz. The curtain's closing on the longest running show in Broadway history. The New York Times reports Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Phantom of the Opera is ending February 18th, 2023. Producers say they simply can't keep up with weekly running costs since returning from the pandemic. Phantom won seven Tony Awards in 1988, including Best Musical. And it's about a mask-wearing opera lover who falls in love with a young soprano at the Paris Opera House. The show is known for its famous scene where a chandelier crashes onto the stage. It's 35 years on Broadway. It's been seen by nearly 20 million people engrossed $1.3 billion. That's a success. And Japanese cultural festivities took place over the weekend in New York City, and our very own NTD's Sean Marshall was there. Japanese food and Japanese culture are happening at Japan Fest in New York City, a pretty popular place to be. As you can see, the event was packed. An assortment of businesses were making their Japanese products available to the public. Traditional dress, pop culture, and more food than any one person could eat. Many foods at Japan Fest might be unrecognizable to the average American. Moshi Yuzu juice was selling a drink made from the yuzu fruit something you'll have trouble finding in the United States. So yuzu is an East Asian citrus. It's like more common in Korea, Japan, and China. Like in Korea, they use it to like make like yuzu toast. And in like Japan, they use it like a lemon. Moshi yuzu juice started around the pandemic. So they had a rough time getting started and getting the drink into people's hands. Now that like the pandemic is kind of over again, we're like allowed to do events and like sponsor like the Asian community a lot in New York City. So yeah, we're still growing and like trying our best. Japan Fest is not lacking in color or creativity. Key ingredients in the foods by Just For Cakes. Well, we try to really feature Asian and Southeastern flavors. For example, pandan is a leaf that's derived in Southeastern Asia. It's really pretty, it has that bright green color. It goes well with coconut and butterscotch. Gives off kind of like a ricey aroma. New York's Japanese American Lions Club had a professional chef and is donating their proceeds to charities. The Lions Club performs humanitarian services and promotes goodness in communities around the world. For example, a hurricane came a couple of years ago in New York. 
We always donate 3,000 to 5,000. Even during the Japan earthquake, we were working, so we sent money, about 50,000 to 100,000 dollars. You can check out japanfest.com for future events. They have multiple pop-ups each month planned around New York City scheduled throughout October. Sean Marshall, NTD News. And Oktoberfest is in full swing in Munich for the first time since the start of the pandemic. In the Andrew Thomas is the latest on the German Beer Festival. Germany's annual Oktoberfest festival is finally on again, following a two-year hiatus due to pandemic lockdowns. It is beautiful, and as you can see, the enthusiasm has returned, and I am sure that all Munich residents and guests are looking forward to Oktoberfest again. Over 400 breweries, restaurants, fish and meat grills, wine vendors, and others are attending. The first beer tents open at 9 a.m. and close at 10.30 p.m. A two-pint mug of beer costs between $12 and $14 this year, an increase of about 15% compared with 2019, according to the official Oktoberfest homepage. Hofbrau is one of the breweries at Oktoberfest. According to the brewery's head technician, the beer has a special taste this year. Our Oktoberfest beer has a bright golden color. It smells of honey, cookie, but also citrus and has light floral notes from the hops. Many revelers are dressed in traditional Bavarian garb. For designer Lola Paltinger, history is her muse. So on the one hand, I really, really like to be inspired by history, not only history, but I also like to go all the way back to Victorian times. So lots and lots of details from different eras. But just as important, of course, is really the current fashion. Women dress up in dirndl dresses and the men in lederhosen. And Paltinger knows what's in fashion. I really have the feeling that everyone is really craving for color, for a bit of opulence, for celebrating, of course, for having a good time. I'm really looking forward to Oktoberfest. And yes, of course, I find that very, very beautiful. And the Dirndl this year can be a little lusher, a little more glamorous, a little more opulent. The popular beer festival runs from September 17th to October 3rd. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And researchers have confirmed the existence of a space diamond after finding it on the Earth's surface. It's harder and stronger than a regular diamond. If scientists figure out how it was formed, it could inspire a way to manufacture super durable industrial components. The new research published last week suggests it came from a meteorite. One theory from the geologist who found it is the meteorite came from a dwarf planet which was struck by an asteroid. Sounds like a movie. That released pressure and that led to the formation of these unique diamonds. And you say tomato, I say tomato. Well, what about this thing? Apparently it tastes, smells, even looks like a kind of tomato. Tomato Makes sense because it is a tomato. It's just purple. The genetically modified produce was developed by a team of scientists and just got USDA approval, clearing the way to be sold at a grocery store near you. And this tomato isn't just pretty and purple. Scientists who make it say it has more antioxidants and a longer shelf life than the green variety red tomatoes. Next step is to get the thumbs up from the FDA, then off to store shelves. Would you eat one? That's the latest on the NTD Business Team and myself, Paul Graney. Follow me on Twitter, though, if you're there. Oh, if you have any news tips, feedback for the show, email us, business at ntd.com. That's all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.